Hi everyone, and welcome to this video where we look at an item in my classic computer collection. And today we're going to have a look at a peripheral, and uh, this is a peripheral that most computers of the early 1980s and mid-1980s ended up with. A very useful piece of equipment, and often the first accessory that people bought after they purchased their shiny new computer. It is the dot matrix printer. So we'll have a look at uh, one individual model, but really this video is largely going to be about dot matrix printers per se, uh, as a class of technology that uh, developed during that period. So let's take a look at it. Before dot matrix printers became common, there were these. This is a line printer. As the name would suggest, one line was printed at a time. This model, in fact, was the first computer printer I ever saw in the flesh. It was housed with the terminals in our university department's computer room. The printer was large, it was noisy, and it was very fast. It used perforated wide-fold paper, and its prime purpose was to spool off results of statistical analyses of experiments. So you'd often see printouts the thickness of encyclopedias waiting for collection underneath it. Line printers like this were associated with mainframe and mini computers. Like those machines, these types of printers were huge, they were expensive, and they were designed for industrial volume hard copy containing calculations and data. Dot matrix printers work differently to line printers. This image shows how. In the dot matrix printer, the characters are formed by pins in the printer head which impact shapes onto paper through an ink-soaked ribbon as the head moves from left to right and vice versa. Once a pass is made, the paper then advances a line and the whole process starts again. The ink ribbon continuously advances, hence providing a consistency in print quality. As you can imagine, the whole process takes a lot longer than it does in a line printer. The late 1970s and early 80s saw a proliferation of personal computers for both home and business. These were computers individuals could own. They were great for tinkering with and playing games, but their use was considerably enhanced if they could be married up with a printer. Monolithic and expensive line printers were out of the question. Dot matrix printers, on the other hand, filled that niche perfectly. Dot matrix printers for microcomputers worked either via a serial or a parallel connection. Parallel connections became increasingly popular simply because data could be sent to the printer from the computer faster. Rather than one bit at a time, eight bits at a time could be used. Also, there was a standard for the parallel interface developed during the 1970s by a company called Centronics. This was widely, widely adopted and called the Centronics interface or simply a Centronics compatible parallel port. Early dot matrix printers for personal computers tended to be big and clunky. This C. Ito one shown here by Dick Smith is an example. In fact, this was the first printer I owned, which I obtained soon after getting the microcomputer that's sitting next to it. The printer was heavy, it was noisy, and it shook the table when it printed. Some of these early dot matrix printers were so noisy, you could buy special hoods to put over them to keep the noise down. One other thing. These early dot matrix printers, including the model I just showed you, were often without true descenders, so that lowercase letters, like G and J, sat on the line of text rather than going below it. You can see that in the image here. Furthermore, the typeface was set, and the early machines couldn't produce graphics. Lastly, the quality wasn't good in that if you looked closely, or even not that closely, you could see the letters were made up of a series of dots. Despite these limitations, these early printers did make microcomputing more useful, and personally I found having a printer led me to more letter writing and producing notes and draft articles for my job, where at that time pen, pencil and the office typing pool were the technologies of the day. In 1980, a groundbreaking printer model was introduced. This was the Epsom MX80. Its influence on the development of personal dot matrix printers was huge. The Epsom MX80 was attractive, it was affordable, print quality was reasonable, it had true descenders and had a small footprint 
on a desk. It also had a number of print types. It could print in Pika, condensed, expanded and emphasised modes. With the firmware upgrade called GraphTrax, it could also do a lot more, including print graphics. IBM was so impressed that they chose a modification of the Epson MX80 to accompany the introduction of the IBM PC in 1981. This no doubt assisted the printer's popularity. From that time onwards, most dot matrix manufacturers ensured their printers were backwardly compatible with the Epson MX80. During the early 1980s, Epson improved on the basic model and other firms followed suit. Very soon printers appeared which could print graphics as standard along with letters. People could use single sheets of A4 rather than needing fan fold paper with holes in them. Printing speed improved and so did resolution with the addition of more pins in the head. Near letter quality became the norm, which was acceptable for many printing tasks. There were many companies involved, and a number of models were simply clones of the Epson range. So let's get close up and personal with one of these Epson compatible dot matrix printers. This is a Panasonic KXP1081. So let's just have a quick overview. You can see the switches there for doing various things like turning it on, putting it online, advancing a page or advancing a line manually. It just shows the model name. Switch there on the left. You can select between normal mode, near letter quality or compressed mode. And there's a toggle lever which switches between tractor feed and friction feed. Tractor feed if you want to use that fan fold paper at the back. So quite a nice looking unit, unit very stylish. Uh, date would be probably around about 1983-84 for this one. Just give you a close look at the insides there. You can see the um, bar that the head slides to and fro on along with the graduated scale for lining the paper up. So if we have a look at the back, this is what it looks like. Those uh, metal guides are useful for feeding paper in and stacking it up when it comes out. There's the label. Uh, this is usually covered with a plastic uh, cover, but the cover's missing. But you can see there the um, printer port. That's a pretty typical looking Centronics compatible printer port and that's what the end of the plug looks like. Right, let's have a closer look inside the printer. So we take the cover off and you can see there the head and also the ribbon. You can see the ribbons contained in a cartridge. Also some dip switches there for various settings. So I think what we'll do now is to uh, load some paper in. I'll just show you how friction fed paper uh, is attached to the printer first. Very very easy, this is all you do. Uh, slot it in the bottom of the roller there and uh, wind it round and the printer's all ready to go for friction fed paper. On the other hand, if we wanted to use the tractor feed, we flick that lever uh, on the left hand side there, feed this in uh, around those sprockets and once we get it pushed up towards the top, there it comes, feed it around, can be a little tricky and we flick those covers off the sprockets and just Gently attach the paper so that the uh, it fits into those sprockets nicely, and we're all set to go. Just uh, rack it up to the top of the form. Now we'll just grab our cover to make it uh, make it look nice. So that just simply slots in. It's held there by friction. Here we are, all ready to go. 
uh, and now we'll print off some copy from our IBM XT sitting next to the printer. Well having assembled that all very nicely I think I'll take the top and the front off again just to let you see the print process in action so I'll now push the button on the XT uh, for print and there you can see in here the dot matrix printer in action it's printing out a document it's actually the notes I made for this video um, given that we're talking about old style technology here I thought I'd uh, type out these notes on the IBM XT um, just so that it's of the same era so to speak and now uh, we're printing these out on a 1980s printer so you can see it's uh, not tremendously fast uh, it is in what they call normal or standard mode which is draft mode essentially and in fact I think the printer ink is getting a little down it's usually a little it's darker than that so that's uh, quite faint but might be starting to run out of ink in the cartridge so we push the button to uh, advance the paper a bit and uh, there we have it our printed document all done albeit a little light so that was essentially draft mode I just want to print that out again except this time I'll use near letter quality mode and you can see how that works so uh, there we go starting our print job and now you can see what happens with this near quality mode is that the head runs over the same piece of text twice except what happens is that it fractionally advances the paper before the second pass so it tends to smooth out those dots a little uh, gives, it a, gives it a double go and uh, tends to make it a lot clearer and, uh, and less faint let's get a closer look at that so we'll take the camera off the tripod and I'll zoom in to get a a better look. You can see the print here there whizzing backwards and forwards on the guide. And you can see the uh, printing being done and that's where it's coming from. It's good old word star on my IBM XT. Well that's probably enough of that, uh, it can start to be a bit like watching paint dry, uh, once you've seen it once, uh, you don't really need to look at it too long, so uh, let me show you what its self-test looks like. Now most dot matrix printers have this feature, uh, if you hold a couple of buttons down and you turn it on, it essentially does a self-test, so it it starts printing its character set, you don't need to have it attached to a computer and it's a good way to just check everything is working ok once you've set it up so off it goes, uh, I'll just grab the camera and give you a close up of that and you can see there it's uh, again in near letter quality uh, printing all of its characters so I've got the manual for this printer. This is the days, of course, when you used to get uh, fairly substantial manuals when you've got peripherals. Uh, this is pre-web, so there's no such thing as a PDF download. Um, you've got the real deal. This is quite a uh, comprehensive manual. It's A4, pretty well written. Um, shows you how you can make the computer dance, and, uh, sorry, how you can make the printer dance and sing uh, using various ASCII codes and basic and also how to set it up uh, what those dip switches do and some of the other characteristics of the machine 
always pretty good to uh, to have, of course, uh, the documentation with your accessories. So having seen a typical dot matrix printer, let's now have a look at the uh, printers that I've got, and here they are. Uh, this one in the front here, it's a very similar model to the one that I showed. In fact, the one that I showed didn't belong to me. It um, doesn't belong to me, it belongs to a friend, and I borrowed it because this one is a little bit yellowed, even though it's virtually the same, or a very similar model. Um, and so... You can see it there. Coming around this side, we've got our Commodore plotter. This is probably not a dot matrix at all. I'm not sure what the mechanism of uh, for this plotter is, but nice little unit. And here we have this huge and heavy Ito unit, very much like the, the one that I originally bought my very first printer was like this except it was uh, not as wide as this one if we open it up you'll see that uh, it's got two spools at either end for the ribbon so it doesn't have a, a ribbon cartridge like those more modern printers and you can see the head there so essentially we're talking about older technology I would say this printer probably came out in 1980 perhaps maybe even earlier so if we squeeze around uh, the back it's a bit of a, a squeeze here so just maneuver myself around and here's a little star printer this is probably the pick of the bunch this one actually because it's a color printer it's a dot matrix but it's uh, Got lots of option, quality is very, very good. There's still quite a few uh, indicator lights and buttons there on the front. If you have a look inside, you can see it's got a ribbon cartridge, a lot like the uh, power solid. So there they are, my, my babies. Uh, I never went out of my way to collect printers. I got these printers simply... Um, because they came with the computers that I collected, so people essentially gave them to me. So what killed off the dot matrix printer for personal computing? Essentially it was models like this. This is the Hewlett Packard Inkjet 500, and these inkjet printers uh, came out about the mid-80s. Uh, at least they became cheap enough uh, for people to use them with microcomputers, and they were quiet, they um, gave you a very good print quality and essentially uh, start to dominate um, the personal printer market pretty quickly. I should also mention that it wasn't only dot matrix printers that were hooked up to microcomputers in the early to mid 1980s. Uh, there were also uh, printers around that were called daisy wheel printers and they uh, gave a quality akin, akin to a typewriter, so it's, they were very good quality. Uh, they used a rotating wheel with uh, essentially the characters on the wheel, so uh, they stamped images of those characters onto paper. Uh, thing is, these were very slow, and they couldn't print, print graphics. And then you also had the laser printers, which came out around about, um, well, they were around in the early 80s, uh, a bit more popular in the mid-80s. Laser printers, though, were very, very expensive. Uh, so those are the other two types of printers that uh, were around at that time. Well, those of you that had a computer in the late 1970s through to the mid-1980s wouldn't have learned much from all this video, but hopefully uh, it generated a little bit of nostalgia for you, uh, seeing these old machines again and, and hearing them work. Uh, if you were younger and you've only heard about dot matrix printers, Hopefully this video was informative for you. So that's it this for this time. So until the next video, keep well, and we'll see you then.